Hi, church family. I just want to thank you so much for joining us tonight online to view our Christmas Eve service. As you may know, we intended to have a live Christmas Eve service on Wednesday, but due to the weather, we were not able to do that. So we just want to post something tonight just to say Merry Christmas to you, to remind you of the wonder of this season. And I'd like to read to you tonight from the prophet Isaiah before we open in prayer. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we have one of the famous Christmas passages that is often read. And it speaks to us about who Jesus is and who he will be. It says this, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Will you join me tonight in prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonder of the Advent Christmas season. We thank you for the wonder that God became a man in Jesus. And we thank you, God, that we celebrate that because we know what the end of that was. We know that God became a man to be the sacrifice for our sins. And so tonight, God, on this Christmas Eve, we are grateful. We thank you for sending Jesus for us. And as we think about all that Jesus is, both to us and to history, we pray, God, that even tonight we would remember how much you love us and that you prove that through sending your son, born in a manger, raised, lived sinlessly, and died in our place, and rose again gloriously on the third day. We thank you for the gospel tonight and for the wonder that Christmas is. We pray, Father, you have blessed this service, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good evening, everybody, and Merry Christmas. This isn't the Christmas service that we planned or we hoped for. I guess the weather just had different ideas, but here we are, and I want to take a moment tonight just to talk to you about perspective, perspective at Christmas time. See, perspective is remarkably important. I've got a glass here, and it's up to you to decide is it half full or is it half empty? You see, your answer depends upon your perspective. There's a story of two shoe salesmen that work for the same company that both go to remote parts of the world. The first salesman right back to the company and says, don't bother sending any shoes. Nobody around here wears anything on their feet. The second shoe salesman writes and says, send every shoe it is that you have available because nobody here wears anything on their feet. The salesman's answers to the company depended entirely upon their perspectives. Christmas time, it's amazing how people can have different perspectives, not only of the holiday, but of Christ himself. Of the holiday, we can think of uh, our entertainment and movies. Mr. Scrooge, whose perspective at Christmas is to keep the tightest strings possible on the purse. Or Buddy the Elf, who thinks that the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. But what about more directly within our families? For a mom, it might be having all of her children home to celebrate the holiday together. For kids, it's oftentimes an opportunity to receive some things that is that they asked for. But as Christians, what's our perspective supposed to be at Christmas time? How is it that even as Christians we can see and have such a different perspective at this time of year? Now this evening, I'd like to just consider three perspectives. First would be Mary, second would be God, and in conclusion, and lastly, it's your perspective. Luke 1, 46-55, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Now the first point from Mary's perspective is that Christmas was something to be excited about. She says in verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord. And in verse 47, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary's saying that my soul swells up with joy. It can't help but magnify God for the situation in which she found herself. What is it that your soul has swelled up with at this holiday season? What is it you magnify in your heart? Is your soul magnified with enthusiasm for spending time with those you love? Does your soul swell up with sadness and grief over difficult situations and loved ones who have been lost? Could it be that our hearts swell up and can be magnified with anxiety and frustrations over the things in our lives that we feel we have little control over? See, amongst all the uncertainty, Mary chose to magnify the Lord in gladness. Mary's not rejoicing just for the arrival of her son, but because of who her son is. That he wasn't just coming to be an ordinary boy, an ordinary man. He was the Savior. And Mary needed a Savior just as all of us need a Savior. You see, one broken idea in Christianity is that Christ came and he just wants us to be happy. Well, I'm not about to speak against happiness on Christmas Eve. In fact, even the Old Testament talks about it being a sin to not enjoy life. Because if life came to you from the hand of the good God, then who are we to despise his goodness? But Christ didn't leave the right hand of the Father to come to earth to look at his handiwork. Christ didn't leave the right hand of his Father to come to earth to just simply add to the sum total of our overall happiness. He came to save us. And Mary understood that. The second point that Mary makes very clear is that this first Christmas, it was about God blessing her. In verses 48, 49, and 50, 
She says, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. See, Mary believes that God is blessing her in three different ways. The first is that he's regarded her lowly estate. What she's saying is that God pays attention to me. God pays attention to us. It's not insignificant. It's that when I pray, God pays attention. It's that when I'm joyful and enjoying wonderful things in my life, God's paying attention. When I'm hurt and I'm struggling, God's paying attention. In fact, even when I'm failing to pay attention to God, God's still paying attention to me. She says that God's done great things for me. And the fact is, we can all really say that even those of us that have had a hard life. We can be thankful that we serve a God and we live before a God who doesn't just put things into motion and stand back. He's involved in our lives. The third thing is, she says, that his mercy is upon me. I'm thankful that at Christmas time that God does not give me what it is that I deserve. Rather, it's just as he promised that his mercies are new each morning. The last point from Mary is that at Christmas time, she knew that God was in control. She says in verses 51 to 53, He's shown me strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Now in the early part of Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel talks to Zechariah, and he announces that Elizabeth will bear a son, and he'll be called John. See, Gabriel does this. The announcement that he makes is the fact that God is in control. He'll do the same thing as he visits Mary, and he talks about the one that she will give birth to is a virgin conceiving and giving birth to a son. It's miraculous. It's unheard of. See, God's the only one in the business of doing miracles. He's entirely in control. In 2022, it's easy for us to look around and wonder if God really is in control. So many things throughout our world that seem so remarkably difficult. Immense poverty and sickness and devastation. Where is God in all of it? It's hard to have confidence in in our local leaders and in our political world. Wondering, is this all just out of control? Even for me as a youth pastor working with teenagers. There's times it's easy to despair and think about the things that I'm trying to teach them. I'm trying to to demonstrate and to testify with my own life. It all seems so counterproductive against what it is that they've accepted by way of what culture has made normal. But even when I'm faced with despair, I have to remind myself and trust the fact that God is in control. Speaking of God being in control, what about his perspective? My youth pastor used an illustration at Christmas many years ago. And it's not a particularly great illustration, but I guess I remember it all these years later. He talks about a father and son who go on a camping trip together. And as they're out on a hike, they come across a large colony of ants just working furiously. And they they stop and and they watch and they're mesmerized by all of it. At times it seems the ants are working individually. At times it seems they're working as a team. Most of the time it appears they don't even really know what it is that they're doing. So the son says to the father, I wish that I could help them. The father says, if you get any closer, if they sense your presence, they'll stop, they'll scatter. So they keep watching. And the son speaks up and he says, if I could become an ant, even just for a short time, I believe I could help them. I could make a difference. See, to help us, Christ had to become one of us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 say, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. See, it's God's perspective that gives us hope. It's God's perspective that gives us joy. It's God's perspective that provides a great wonder. And it requires a faith that truly he's in control. Now, I think to myself, I can't imagine what it is that was running through God's mind as he looked down on earth and saw his son lying in that manger. 
And though we don't know his mind, Scripture does teach us his heart. See, the fact is that the heart of God would be that man is reconciled to himself through his son. That the heart of God is that you and I would know him by way of his son. The heart of God is that you and I would draw near to him, into relationship with him, is the way he'd always intended through the work of his son. You see, the heart of God is expressed in his coming to earth as one of us in a form that we would know. See, he announces his birth to the shepherds to show that his grace and his love, it's not just for the privileged. It's not just for the notables or for the prosperous. He announces his birth to the wise men to show that his love and his grace and his forgiveness isn't just to one people or group or nation, but for all people. His love is for all who would wait on him and desire it. And this evening, it's my joy to announce to you that same love, that same grace, that same forgiveness that's come in the gift of Jesus who we celebrate at Christmas. I'd just like to encourage you in the midst of your family time and your activities the next few days, take some time to reflect on God's love for you and to consider the leap he took to bridge the gap between his love for us and our being able to love him back. In conclusion, what's your perspective? What is your perspective of Jesus this Christmas? Is it just a tradition? And every year we just need to keep the traditions going. Is it simply a time to just give and show kindness to those around you? Is it a time of hardship and pain and reminders, past experiences in life and people who are no longer with you? Television journalist Harry Reisner writes the following. 11 years ago, I did a little piece. It seemed like a good idea to repeat it. The basis for this tremendous annual burst of buying things and gift buying and parties and near hysteria, it's a quiet event that Christians believe actually happened a long time ago. He goes on to say, you can say that in all societies there's always been a midwinter festival and that many of the trappings of our Christmas are almost violently pagan, but you will always come back to the central fact of the day and the quietness of Christmas morning, the birth of God here on earth. And he goes on to say there's really three ways, three different perspectives that we really can have at Christmas. The first is cynically. It's the accumulation of more, simply adding to the abundance of what we already have. The second perspective is graciously. Perhaps the most appropriate attitude for even non-Christians or unbelievers to give rather than to receive, to take into account and to be mindful of those around you. But for Christians, there's really one perspective that we must have. And it's the perspective of reverence. It's your perspective and your view of God. You do that reverently. Remembering, celebrating, enjoying exactly why it is that this child has come. Because truly, he's come to give his life for all. So in closing, which best describes you? What's your perspective at Christmas, this holiday season? What is your perspective of the greatest gift this world has ever known? What is your perspective of the Savior, Jesus Christ? Father, I thank you so much that even though we're not together this evening, or that we can have the resources that we have to, to still join together to hear your word proclaimed. Father, I thank you once again for the gift that is the church, Lord, we have the church because of your son, what he's done for us. Lord, may each one of us take time to reflect, to consider what our perspective is of you, because truly, our perspective matters for how we live our lives. We pray this all in your son's blessed name. Amen. Bells, bells.